Good morning. morning. How was that worship? Yes. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I am excited to be in the fifth part of our Jesus League series. This is where we are looking at the writers of the New Testament portion of our Bibles, who they were and what they wrote, the witnesses to Jesus, the Jesus League, so to speak. So let's dive right in this morning. This week we are looking at Paul. Now Paul is very difficult to cover because he wrote a lot of books of the New Testament of the Bible, 13 to be exact. So we looked at Luke a couple of weeks ago, and Luke, who was noted, wrote more words than anyone else. 27.5% of the New Testament. We had some fun with the Greek, right? Confused everybody a little bit. That's okay. We're back on track. But Paul writes 13 books, and there are a lot of topics that he covers. So it's really hard to pinpoint one specific theme. We'll look at that a little bit later. So who was Paul? Paul was an apostle chosen by Jesus. He wasn't one of the original 12 apostles that we saw in the New Testament portion, the Gospels of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He wasn't there yet. He wasn't even there in the beginning of Acts. When Judas betrayed Jesus, then he killed himself. They choose a replacement, Matthias. Paul's after that. He's chosen by Jesus. So Jesus, or Paul is kind of like the 14th apostle, you could say. He was first called Saul, He was a part of one of the two leading religious parties of that time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Paul is a Pharisee. He's called by Saul at first, and then later his Roman name, Paul. So we'll look at that in a minute, too. So what did Paul write? I said 13 books, right? Everything between Acts and Hebrews. There's debate about Hebrews. We're not going to get into that today. We know for sure everything between Acts and Hebrews, they're not in chronological order. The Bible doesn't necessarily work that way. They're actually in descending order according to size, Romans being the largest, Philemon being the smallest. They're named by who they're written to, to make it easy. When I first came into church, I didn't get it. Why is it called Romans? Because he's writing to the church in Rome. So if you're new here, I'm trying to help you out a little bit. Corinth, Corinthians, the church in Corinth. Timothy, it's a letter from Paul to Timothy. Pretty easy. Again, themes. Paul's letters address a bunch of different issues in the formation of the early church especially in the inclusion of the Gentiles. If you don't know what a Gentile is, it's anybody who's not Jewish is a Gentile. They're brought in later. Christianity was originally seen as a Jewish sect or a Jewish denomination, if you will. Later, the Gentiles come in, so questions arise. How Jewish do these Gentiles need to be? How do they get along with one another? How do we see this whole thing? So this sets the backdrop for the cultural context of Paul's letters. So let's delve a little deeper into who Paul was. We're going to use Paul and Saul interchangeably, right? So think of it this way in our culture. Most of us have middle names, right? So I'm just going to call him by Paul for the most part here. So as I said, Paul was a Pharisee. And to be a Pharisee, you had to be really smart. Okay, we always make fun of the Pharisees and everything like that. But they were pretty intelligent guys. You had to have the equivalent of the Old Testament portion of our Bibles. There was no Old and New Testament back then, no New Testament yet. You'd have to have that memorized. When I first learned this, I did not believe it. It took me a while to really believe this, a lot of research, but it's true. You had to have it memorized. There were schools back then where a disciple would not be able to get out of bed until he could recite what his teacher told him the day before. Imagine that. (laughs) Not if you're older. (laughs) So let's see what Paul says of himself. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 5. He says that he was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But he wasn't just any old Pharisee. He continues in Acts 23. He's he's speaking here of himself. 
I'm a Jewish man born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and educated according to the strict view of our patriarchal law, being zealous for God just as all of you are today. Okay, so here's where I'm going to pull the tour bus over and point out a few things to you. We're going to have a little bit of fun. You ever see those commercials, like travel commercials, <laughs> where they say something like, you can get a three-day cruise to Puerto Rico for just $3.99. You notice that? They change their accent or they make up one depending on like the foreign word that they're saying. I'm not that guy. I don't like to do that. I think it sounds really funny and I'm not sure but I'm not sure that people from other countries, we'll have to fill me in later, if they'd bother doing that. I think it's like just us, you know, we want to sound really cool. But I don't do it, although I've been told that I should. All right, so I was eating at Fernandez the Bull, great Cuban restaurant. I pl always plug my neighbors. If you've been here before, you know I always talk about food all the time. <laughs> so I'm at the restaurant, right, and I always order how I would pronounce it, the Picadillo Bowl. Right? Because <laughs> I don't want to try, try to pronounce it. I don't speak Spanish at all. So, look, I don't think they expect me to. That's why they have, like, the pictures, the laminated menus with the picture. And I just point to it, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And they never understand me the first time. But my wife, Heather, she's hanging around a lot of people who speak Spanish now, so she, like, thinks she's cool. She tries to encourage me to say picadillo or something like that, right? Did I, I probably butchered it. And, like, so they order ladies first. It comes my turn, right? I get scared. I chicken out. I gave up. I just went like this. And so she's like, oh, yeah, and then says whatever she says really fast. She's Cuban. <clears throat> and, <laughs> and then Heather gives me, like, the I told you so face. <laughs> she can talk without moving her mouth. She speaks with her face, even bad words. So anyway, <laughs> she could speak completely with her face. So I don't want to be that guy. So here's what I'm going to do as a church. I'm going to excuse all of you from pronouncing anything in the Bible right. Because we're not. A lot of people don't know this. This is really silly. Once you start learning, like the, I'm terrible at Hebrew, but getting a little bit better at Greek, you learn how it's actually pronounced. Everything becomes really funny. Because even you see pastors like correcting people on the pronunciation, and it's wrong. Even the way they do it is still, we're not getting it right. I said Saul, right? I said Saul a whole bunch of times. If you heard that in Hebrew, you would never recognize it. It's like Shaul. And I didn't say it right. I just butchered it right there. But that's how it sounds. It's totally and completely ridiculous. So when you get to a word like or a name like Gamaliel, I don't care how you pronounce it. Gamaliel, Gamaliel, I don't, I don't care. Here's the rule. You just, we just have to know, <laughs> Gamaliel, I think. In Hebrew, forget it. We just have to know who you're talking about, right? That's the rule. Simple. We can relax now. So if you're out of, well, actually, I don't make you guys do this at the Bible study for this very reason, right? We don't want silliness like that going on. But if you're reading aloud, I'll give you a little tip. Here's what you can do and you're getting to Gamaliel, and you're panicking, right? You know it's coming, and you got to try to say it. And so you're like, gama ma 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 gamel gmail gama ma 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 Stop. You can go full-on NIV or message translation and say it like this. The guy that taught Paul. That is a thought-for-thought -thought translation. You might even get complimented if there's a pastor there. Oh, you know who he was. Very good, very good, smarty pants. <laughs> so be yourself. Real church, real people here. If you've got a southern accent, Gamaliel, you can say it like that. If you're from France, Gamaliel, you could spice up the whole Bible study for us. All right, everybody, back on the bus. We're going to get going. He was highly educated. That was my point. That's called a digression. Paul does that a lot in the Bible. Tarsus was a modern city. <laughs> it was, a, was in, in modern-day Turkey. That's where it's located. Uh, those of you who are new here are thinking, like, where am I right now? <laughs> Many have stated that Paul was raised and educated in Tarsus. This is not true. If you look at Acts 22.3, Paul makes it clear that he was educated in this city, not Naples, Jerusalem. All right? That's where he was educated and by Gamaliel. <laughs> we see Gamaliel appear in Acts 5. 
All right, so the apostles are arrested and they're preaching Jesus. They refuse to stop. They say, we have to obey God, not men. They get really, really upset. But Gamaliel <laughs> steps in with wisdom and says this, Acts 5, starting at verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill the apostles. A Pharisee, the guy who taught Paul, a teacher of the law, who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. He said to them, Men of Israel, be careful about what you're going to do to these men. Not long ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his partisans or followers were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas, not Judas who betrayed Jesus, the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. That man also perished, and all his partisans were scattered. And now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For this plan, or this work, is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. Remember that for later. So they were persuaded by him. Gamaliel is highly esteemed in Jewish writings, even outside the Bible. The Talmud, he's spoken of as a master teacher, a prince of the Torah. And the Mishnah it says this about him. My tablet just went nuts. Since Rabban Gamaliel, the elder, died, there has been no more reverence for the law, and purity and piety died out at the same time. Pretty strong statement. This gives us some insight into Paul's pedigree. You can view him as like an Ivy League religious scholar. Some of Paul's writings, especially Romans, are considered to be the best theological works ever written, even by non-Christian scholars. Pretty impressive. So, Paul, he was originally, or when he was Saul, originally an enemy of the church. So let's continue reading in Acts and see what happens. We'll continue at Acts 22. He's describing what he did. Acts 22, 4. I persecuted this way to death, Christianity, binding and putting both men and women in jail, as both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. After I received letters from them to the brothers, I traveled to Damascus to bring those who were prisoners there to be punished in Jerusalem. So Paul tells of this in Acts 22. He's looking back, but we see the account at the end of Acts 7 and beginning of Acts 8. But then Paul is converted. So he's on his way to Damascus to round these people up, these Christians, and bang, light flashes from the sky. He is blinded. Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul goes to Damascus. He spends three days there, doesn't eat or drink anything, and he is blinded. Then Jesus sends a disciple named Ananias to him. So we see the account when he arrives there with Paul. Acts 9, 17. So Ananias left and entered the house that Saul was in, Paul. Then he placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so that you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. In the vision to Ananias, just prior to this, this is what the Lord says of Paul. Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and the Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name appointed to go to the Gentiles. So again, this is a little bit strange because Christianity is originally a Jewish religion. It's primarily all Jewish people. In the Gospels, we see very little interaction between Jesus and Gentile people, just a couple times. That's it. When he sends his apostles for the first time, this is what he says in Matthew 10, verse 5. Jesus sent out these 12 apostles after giving them instructions. Don't take the road leading to other nations and don't enter a Samaritan town. He goes on to say, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. That's it. So that's their understanding here. But then, Matthew 28, right at the end, starting at verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations 
baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it takes him a little while to get the point. <laughs> it takes till Acts chapter 10. All right, so we see a little Holy Spirit foreshadowing, maybe, with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. But the full revelation that this new way is to go to the Gentiles too doesn't come to Peter until Acts 10. It takes a little while. And then they're first called Christians in Acts 11 at Antioch. Now Paul is converted in this amazing reversal. Once persecuting the church, and now an apostle of Jesus spreading it to the Gentiles. Remember, he's Jewish, going to the Gentiles. Look at what he says of himself in Galatians 2, starting at verse 13. For you have heard about my former way of life in Judaism. I persecuted God's church to an extreme degree and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who from my birth set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I could preach him amongst the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. Then, after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. But I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, I'm not lying in what I write to you. God is my witness. Afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I remained personally unknown to the Judean churches in Christ. They simply kept hearing, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy. Paul joins the Jesus League. So after his conversion, this is what happens. I want you to look at Acts again with me here. Acts 9.19. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some days. Immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. But all who heard him were astounded, and they said, Isn't this the man who in Jerusalem was destroying those who called on his name and then came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priest? But Saul grew more capable and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this one, Jesus, is the Messiah. So they chased him out of Damascus. Then in Jerusalem, Acts 9, 26, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him since they did not believe he was a disciple. Imagine that, right? So like an enemy comes and he's like, hey guys, I know Jesus. You'd think it was a trick. So they're confused. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, just Greek Jews, but they attempted to kill him. When the brothers found out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. What's the first question you'd ask Paul? Like, if you're Peter, I know what I would say. What did he look like? You'd be suspicious, right? If you saw the Lord, what did he look like? Can you imagine that conversation? Amazing. This is an amazing, amazing reversal, role reversal. And what we're talking about here ultimately is going to be kind of our, our application today is disobedience versus obedience. Paul is obedient. There is another famous Saul in the Bible. If you know your Bible well, you know 1 Samuel, Saul, the king, the first king over Israel. The story is actually a sad one because God is meant to be king over Israel. But the Israelites are like, no, we don't want a king like everyone else. We want to be like everyone else. He's like, no, you don't. <laughs> he warns them, but they want their king. It goes to show us something because Saul is this really attractive guy. He's a head taller than everybody else, right? shows what happens when we elevate man over God. Churches do this. They put preachers and pastors up there real high. And what happens almost every time? They come tumbling down. 
every time. Paul warns about this in 1 Corinthians, and if you read it carefully, you'll see that's why he says, I didn't come to you with fancy speech. He's trying to be humble. So here's what happened. God, through the prophet Samuel, says, fine, you can have your king. He warns them what is going to happen, and it does. So here's the story. <clears throat> He's supposed to totally destroy the Amalekites. It's hard to understand, so we're not gonna, I'm not going to digress again. Don't worry. He's just told to destroy them completely, everything, everyone. He does not. He keeps some of the choice plunder for himself, keeps the king alive too. Samuel has to take care of that later <laughs> in an interesting way. He keeps the plunder. When approached about it, he's not completely honest. He's like, no, 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 I kept all this good stuff because I'm going to sacrifice it to the Lord. Right, he's pressed about it. Finally, he admits it. Yeah, I thought the men would be happy with all the nice stuff. So Saul is a people pleaser. He's codependent. <laughs> so ultimately, he chooses to please people over being obedient, which is huge. So here's the application. Obedience, regardless of cost. We saw that Luke was loyal to Paul in extreme obedience, right? Following Luke or Paul is not easy. It means shipwrecks. I don't want to get shipwrecked, right? We talked about Paul's mission trip. If he came here to C3 Church, hey guys, you want to go on a mission trip? You know, put a sign-up sheet out for it. We're going to Iran, remember? <laughs> what could go wrong, you know? <laughs> Gene, how many people signed up, right? Just you and the Holy Spirit. That's it, right? We looked at that. It's not easy. I wouldn't want to follow Paul. But he went wherever the Lord led, regardless of the cost. Amazing. He's warned. He goes anyway. We can see his obedience to the Holy Spirit in Acts 13. He doesn't go some places. He goes some places completely obedient to the Lord's leading. He didn't have King Saul's codependency problem. We were talking about walking the walk and being an example last week. So let's bridge these two ideas together with 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Example, God uses some of the most unexpected people to be a part of his story, to carry out his plan. If you don't think you're good enough, look at Paul. Last week, we talked about the fact that we all fall short. We've all messed up. But we talked about some action steps, right? Start walking in obedience. Maybe you're feeling led to take the next step, but thinking you can't. Maybe you don't think you're worthy. Maybe you don't think you're good enough. But think about this. Did you see how God used Paul? He was the last guy. They were scared. He was the last guy anybody would have thought would preach Jesus. He was an enemy of the church. But he goes on to write 13 books of the Bible. Let that soak in for a minute. It's pretty amazing. We looked at the opening of Philippians. I put it up on the screen in Greek. Remember, he says, to all the saints who are in Philippi, to all the saints, that word also means holy, it's interchangeable. You are the saints that Paul is writing to, universally speaking. You are holy, righteous, and redeemed. Remember that. If it helps, think this way. Sometimes I do. Maybe you're afraid of what people might think. We see that example, right? The apostles, <laughs> they get themselves in trouble. People don't like them. 
because of their message. So if it helps, contrast it with Paul's example. Most likely, you're not going to have to go through a shipwreck. (laughs) It might not be as bad. Jesus is the ultimate example. But if you remember also in Philippians, we were just there, so I'm using that as a reference a lot. Paul said, use me as an example. Do what you see me doing. That's okay. We see it there in 1 Timothy, an example. So let's look to this holy man of the faith for encouragement. Sometimes this is what I do when I've got to prepare a hard message. (laughs) I know it's not going to be popular. But I think, well, at least I'm not going to get shipwrecked. Hopefully not. That's why I don't go on boats. Galatians 1.10. Paul says this. For am I now trying to win the favor of people or of God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. Christianity is not a popularity contest, contrary to popular belief. I talked about that false preaching and the fast food teaching last week. We are called to a higher calling than the cheap and disposable things of this world, the temporary prosperity or popularity. We're called to a heavenly call in Christ Jesus, to the hope of eternal life, which doesn't perish or fade away. Our plan is from God and not men. Remember, we saw that in Acts. I told you to remember that. Therefore, it cannot be overthrown. When you are obedient to the Lord and walking according to his commands, the enemy is no longer fighting against you alone, but against God. Amen? He wants to use you. He wants you to be a part of his plan his purpose for you. You just have to take the blinders off to see it. You got to let the scales fall from your eyes. You have purpose in the Lord. That's what I want you to hear this morning. So I hope that my words today have encouraged you to seek that purpose, or if you know what it is, to take those first bold steps and get on the path. Let the Lord lead. Amen? Amen. God bless. Love you guys.